Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome, welcome again uh, to another Audrey Live here Thursday at 1 p.m. And uh, I'm Audrey DeYoung, and uh, just excited again for another show. Today, we have uh, a couple of great treats for you. Uh, we have uh, Paula Jones is on today, and uh, she's a great friend of mine and just extremely knowledgeable for sure about all different aspects of business. And uh, she will be chatting about how COVID has changed the crafting markets. And we also will get a little sneak peek into a Spellbinder product video. Uh, we also have a special treat for you today. Um, Holly Hanley uh, is going to give us just a little bit of a a tidbit, uh, uh, it's kind of like a little video she's been working on, which they're just adorable. They're just cute and you'll just enjoy it. So um, anyway, wanted just to start off by saying last night we had our run through for tomorrow's Pin It Canada uh, live virtual event. And it was incredible. It was just a great run through. Uh, all the presenters <clears throat> are very excited about being on the show. And, uh, and being part of this first event. Uh, this obviously is the week that we would have been in London right now at Fanshawe College for Pinnock Canada. So tomorrow's kind of a little bit of a, a give, give back for those who uh, were going to be part of the event and those that uh, might not have been able to make it, but uh, everybody can share in all the information now from that. So um, make sure while you're on today, that you post comments, let me know where you're from. I try to look at the comments as much as I can. Uh, if you have any questions for me or for Paula, uh, we'll be looking to take some questions as well throughout the, the show. Um, make sure that you um, share it with your friends as well. And if you can't make the, the whole show and perhaps not all the shows, you definitely can go on our YouTube channel and uh, take a look at them there. And we'll put that link uh, later on as well. So um, anyway, I just wanted to make uh, uh, this week's announcement from the government. I was really excited that uh, this week we can now gather up to 10 people after Friday. So this was something I was really excited about because uh, next weekend uh, is my youngest daughter, Tinica's 30th birthday. Sorry, Tinica. <sighs> but we're really excited that uh, my oldest daughter, Ashley, and her son, or her husband, Sam, and Micah and Anna can all come down and join us. Um, and Tinica and uh, Jason and Daphne and myself, my husband, we can all get together and celebrate her birthday. And uh, so many other things that we have to celebrate. Uh, so, you know, small groups, they're saying, you know, 10, we can start with 10. So we're comfortable with that. And we're just really excited about that weekend. So, so what are you thinking about? You know, what are some of the things that you're looking forward to? Um, you know, maybe events in the next couple of weeks now that you can start organizing uh, family get togethers or friend get togethers, uh, of course, being safe and, and, and that sort of thing. But it's just really nice that Things are opening up and that we can all uh, begin to be part of uh, a little bit more of our families and gatherings and instead of talking over Zoom that we can actually get together. So, um, so first what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a little video from Holly Hanley, a uh, special treat. She's been posting a lot of these speed painting. So hopefully some of you have seen it, but I just thought they were so adorable, just like Miss Holly herself. Um, and she's got them on her Facebook page. Uh, and then you can get the, um, the actual patterns from her website, which is hollyhanley.ca. So the one we're going to show you today is Grow a Happy Life Gnome. Um, Holly also will be on our show tomorrow live. So that'll be exciting too, to have her there. So let me just... Uh, get this on here for you and hopefully my technology here will <laughs>
Well, wasn't that adorable? <laughs> I just thought it was so great to see that fast painting technique. Um, talked to Polly, Holly last night about it. And she said it's, it's typically 30 to 35 minutes for her to paint it. And, uh, and then they just kind of speed it, speed demon it. So uh, yeah, I just thought that was just really cute. So uh, had to share that. So make sure you go to Holly's uh, Facebook page and uh, also to, um, to her website for more information. So anyway, I will talk later on about our virtual event uh, as well, but just you know, a quick comment about it, that it is tomorrow from 12 till five Eastern, Easter time, Eastern time. So make sure you put that on your calendar. Uh, if you go to our website um, and the, for those who get our e-newsletter, all the details were in there. So who's presenting and when uh, and what. So, you know, whether you want to sit for five hours and watch it or just watch certain sec segments. And then afterwards, we will be putting it on our YouTube channel. So you can always go back and, and watch that at your leisure. So, um, so today, our guest, Paula Jones. Um, she is a dynamic and positive woman, and I've known her for many years, and, and our, our paths have crossed in so many different aspects of our uh, careers. We have organized a couple of retreats together for CHA uh, and always enjoy working in, with Paula. Paula Jones has worked in all levels of the craft industry over the past 20 years. She owned a wholesale craft company, taught, hi Paula, Caught, taught Hi. consumer classes, written for trade magazines, and worked both for the Canadian and the U.S. Craft and Hobby Association. Currently, Paul is the sales manager uh, for independent retailers for the Spellbinder Paper Arts based out of Arizona. And welcome, Paula. Hello. Hello. How hello. are you? Good. How are you, you today? survived last night's storm? Good. Did you survive last night's storm? Well, yes, actually, we were driving in last week night storm. <clears throat> wow. <laughs> yes, we were in London because that's where we were doing our run through for tomorrow's show. And uh, of course, as we were just getting ready to leave, um, it was just black towards our area. And we're probably a good 40 minute drive and we just drove on through it. And yeah, we said we I don't think I've seen a storm like that in a long time. Mm -hmm. How did you, how was it? Did you get quite a bit there as well? It was very brief. It was a quick flash. I uh, oh, lost really? a couple of branches, but uh, it was over really quickly. I think it, we just caught the tail end of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. So give us a little background about yourself and how did you get into the creative industry? Holy moly. You want the short and, version? The short, yeah. <laughs> I can. I mean, we got time. I've always been kind of crafty. My mother used to sew and stuff like that. And then um, after my, I guess after my third child was born, I was down in Utah and got introduced to Creative Memories and uh, came home, started to do some stuff with that because, of course, back in 97, there wasn't much around in Canada. And one thing led to another. I ended up teaching. I ended up doing some work for uh, Microsoft and for Lexmark and for Fujifilm. And then from there, I ended up with my own um, wholesale business with a, with my husband and partners. And then from there, I worked for the Canadian Craft and Hobby Association. And then to CHA, the Craft and Hobby Association out of the US. And then things just kind of snowballed. So I pretty much worked in every aspect of the industry at some point, you know, teaching, writing, um, selling wholesale, selling retail, I've been there, done that. <laughs> You've done it all. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now, 
you're located just north of Toronto, correct? Yep, just in Caledon. Yeah, and uh, so how many children do we have? Five. Five children. And do you have little ones yet? Grandchildren? Oh, yes, we just had a, a grandson in January. So oh, uh, he, awesome. he has been able to come over. They live locally. And, uh, you know, it's my daughter's first. And so he's been a great distraction. We've been taking lots of photo shoots with him, dressed up in different costumes and posting those on Facebook. So he has, he's been quite accommodating. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> so we've great. We've been in different ways. I've seen some of the posts. I'm like, oh, he's such a good baby. Just, <laughs> no, you know, just laying there so nicely in the costumes. Yeah. Maybe give us an idea. What is one of the ones that you've done? Um... Oh, we did um, the Muffin Man. So I managed to get a uh, chef's hat and we laid him on the floor with all the baking equipment and I made some muffins and we put flour all over his face and gave him a wooden <laughs> spoon to hold. So that was kind of cool. <laughs> uh, we uh, covered him with um, fruit and um, little um, umbrellas and he was pina colada. You know, I, I like pina colada. Oh, we stick the, the umbrella into his bottle. So just crazy little stunts like that. So yeah. uh, well, my daughter good. rolled her eyes. I've got a few more up my sleeve. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Nice to be able to do things like that and, and uh, you know, laugh through this crisis that we're all going through. So. Well, it, it's kind of typical with this crisis that people are becoming more inventive. I mean, originally we start, I mean, we've done about 30 different shoots at this point, but originally we started because he was born in January and he had these cute outfits that nobody was ever going to see. Oh, yeah. So we said, oh, well, let's, let's dress him up and post them so everybody can see. And then we got a little bit more creative and a little bit more creative. And that's how it went. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. So we're kind of here today, first of all, to talk about how COVID has changed the crafting market. So what are some things that you have seen how COVID has changed the, the craft consumer, first of all? Oh. Well, we can all see that everybody is crafting now. I mean, grandmas, grandpas, aunts, uncles, everybody is finding some way to craft. And we're not just talking paper crafting, we're talking baking, we're talking gardening, we're talking using those toilet rolls that hoarders have been <laughs> using. There's been lots of different ways that people have been crafting. Of course, with homeschooling, you know, you need to have the, some supplies. So people have been creative in finding supplies for their science projects and for things like that. Um, people have been bored. They want to do stuff. So anybody that crafts already has been using up the stash and they want more stash. Anybody that wasn't a crafter before is suddenly discovering that, hey, you know, this is kind of fun. So yeah. that's, it's changing attitudes at this point. I mean, you only have to walk through Walmart and see the crafting section is, is it looks like it's been ravaged. <laughs> you know, the Crayola section is, is completely gone. Um, you know, with the, the, everybody's going online for ideas, um, yeah. things that they can see and, and things that they can do. Um, also, I think you can find that, you know, people whose weddings had to be postponed or canceled or they couldn't have people come over. Well, you can't have all those decorative flowers anymore or those decorations. So people have become very, very creative hmm. in filling those needs. And I think that that kind of creativity isn't going to go away. It's made this this time uh, unique. And I think people are rediscovering the basics and the, the things that are fun. I mean, technology, yes, has its place and it's never going to go away. But, you know, picking up a paintbrush and that kind of stuff, people are rediscovering um, the stress relief in, in, crea in creating and crafting. And yeah. I think that's, that's going to be um, the legacy of crafting during COVID. Totally. I, I agree. I know even myself, you know, I've pretty well gone through my stash. Um, I've been doing kits for our neighbors. So I've, uh, and then now when I, like a couple of the projects we've been doing are painting projects. And I, you know, you have to give each, everybody little paint. So I'm looking for these little paint pots to put the paint in. Well, I can't find them anywhere. You know, <laughs> we've gone to, you know, I've, I've tried to order them online. We've gone to every dollar store or Dollar Tree. And it's just amazing how so many different craft supplies you just cannot get anymore. And, yeah. uh, but it's, yeah, and it's great to see. And it's great to see so many people crafting and, and uh, doing different things because right now they have time. So like you said, they're kind of doing the one craft and think, well, you know what? I have time now, maybe I will 
you know, try something, try my hand at knitting or at scrapbooking or the journals, the COVID journals that everybody's doing right now is really incorporating all different type of craft forms. So that's kind of unique to see as and well. Any, pro yeah. any projects they had lo looking around, they're now finished. <laughs> yeah. Those quilts, they've been sitting there for years. They're finished now. <laughs> So, and uh, yeah, like you were saying, there's lots of different places that people are doing things like uh, you had mentioned about, you know, painted stones and in the neighborhood, different things that people are uh, leaving and banners they're making and things like that. So what are other things that you are seeing crafting in the community? Well, I mean, for sure, you know, everywhere you go now, there's banners outside people's houses, uh, thanking the essential workers. Um, you know, even stores are using crafting supplies for directing traffic and putting arrows on the, on, um, on the floors to, to, to keep safe distances um, for birthdays and stuff. I mean, the painted stones ones, um, in my hometown in England, some lady came on and she painted this beautiful snake head and she put it in the local park and she invited people to add body parts. That snake wow. is now 300 feet long. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so, you know, just things... Yeah, and of course, you know, the face masks, the, the shortage of elastic um, and people sharing their stash online, too. It, it's it's really quite something to see all these things that are going on. And I don't think it's going to it's going to go any away anytime soon. I mean, stores are opening, but the limits on um, who can go in and how and people are scared to go out. So this this is going to continue for a while, um, not just during the crisis, but it'll be the legacy of COVID moving yeah, forward yeah. perfect perfect and how is it going to affect the the consumer craft market after covid like what are the some of the things that we might see afterwards well, or look to afterwards i think the homemade is going to be continue as i mentioned um also i think there's going to be a boost to crafting as again the legacy is going to continue there's going i think we're going to have a great homemade christmas um, you know, people are going to be making Christmas cards now. Um, they're going to be making Christmas decorations now. I mean, I'm sure there'll be the stores will be more open, but I think that you'll find that um, companies will be producing more kits and program products that can be made at home, or they're partially assembled or partially created already. There was already that movement, but I think that's going to get even um, even bigger. Um, I think. Um, as far as the craft market, I think the retailers are going to be more creative, mm -hmm. even more creative than they are right now. There's going to be more innovation. There's going to be designers. There's going to be new YouTube stars with new products and stuff. We're already starting to see that. Um, there's going to be, I, we're going to wait for whatever the latest COVID, post-COVID fans going to be. I haven't quite seen it yet. There's a few <laughs> things out there, but you know it's coming. And yeah, people yeah. are going to jump on that bandwagon. So, um, you know, as far as retailers are concerned, they're going to be watching and waiting for that. Um, I think the virtual events are here to stay. We've been yeah. talking about virtual events for years and everybody's been resistant because they didn't want to do it. They didn't want the technology. They, you know, the technology was a little rustic and it's still in some, some places it is. It's, it's still expensive if you want to do it really well. Mm -hmm. But I think... Um, people are going to get more and more tech savvy. I, I feel feel bad for the older generation. Um, there was a virtual event last Saturday and uh, we, Spellbinders, participated and we had done a pre-recorded video and everything. And 75% of the people could see the video and it was fine. But the other 25% were just complaining that oh, I can't see it. Wants it. You know, at that point, if 75% of the people are seeing it, the problem is on the consumer side. Yeah. So they're going to have to become more tech savvy um, in order to do that. And I think, you know, the Facebook lives are great. I think there's going to be more innovations in that respect across the board, not just for crafting. Yeah. And I see so many people now actually that probably never had a Facebook account before that are opening Facebook's account, account so that they have <laughs> the availability to see a lot of these things. So it's um, really kind of interesting. And I know even like my mother, for instance, you know, we do Zoom with her. And like, she has a computer and she sees her emails come through, but that's typically, you know, all she uses it for. But now she can use Zoom and she can go there from the Netherlands. So on Sunday morning, she can go and see her church service from over in Holland. And, you know, so they, people are getting a little bit more tech savvy because they feel like they probably need to at this point in time. If they want to be 
you know, viewing things or seeing different things or being part of these live events or virtual events, they have to know how to use the technology. I mean, I think everybody, it doesn't matter what level you're at, we've had to learn, right? We've had to adapt. So... And update the technology. I think the problem on the weekend was that during the week, Facebook had updated something and people hadn't added the update to their, to their login. Um. And so, you know, you've got to be more. And I think that that tells on the organizers side, too, that the organizers have to be aware of challenges that were going to come up. And I was just uh, communicating with the organizer for that event on Saturday. And I said, you know, you may want to do a brief like 20 minute pre-event a couple of days before to test the system yeah. so that people can say, okay, it's not working for me. What do I need to do to make it work come Saturday? That yes. kind of thing. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. I think yeah, that's a challenge. A bit more. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. a challenge to get everybody on board to do a, a test, just like we did a run through last night with our presenters. But it's still, you know, to get everybody to be able to, you know, have that time to come on to Zoom or whatever the platform they're using and uh, make sure, yeah. you know, that everything's running properly. You know, same sort of thing. Zoom did an update at the end of May. So anybody who hasn't been on since then, as soon as they come on, they have yep. to do this update. And they're like, oh, what's this? You know, like they're, they're questioning what they're watching. So... <laughs> That was me. That was me earlier in the week. I had no video. I had to get my husband to sit out of, I said, I've got this call with Audrey and I'm supposed to be on video. <laughs> so I, it's me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I finally have figured it out. It's, it's been, it's been a, it took me two or three weeks to make sure that I knew how everything worked. But yeah, it's just, it's a learning curve. It's a lot of YouTube videos. It's a lot of reading. So, but um so another thing was how it's does interesting. It's hybrid. Go ahead. I said it's interesting. It's like a hybrid of homemade and tech. Yes. You have to get the balance right. Yes. No, that's exactly right. Exactly right. Because that's I've been doing a lot more of both. Like with the painting, normally I don't have yeah. a lot of time for my crafting, but you know now you do because you don't go out on the weekends and you you don't go out at, at nighttime. You know, so you have all that free time to uh to just craft so so and how is this <laughs> going to change the independent craft retailers from their aspect oh they have to pivot they have to be able to change on a dime and they can do that overnight which is a great advantage over the big box stores i listened to a podcast yesterday um which was it just it's just typical and it was about spiders in space and like, oh yeah, how's that got to do with independent retailers? <laughs> well, apparently in 1973, they took spiders into space, into the Skylab, to see if spiders would be able to spin a web. Well, they let these spiders go, and the first few days, it was just hysterical. It was like drunken spiders. They had no idea what they were doing because spiders are used to gravity, and they use gravity in order to make the webs. But after a few days, the squat fighters had figured out that no longer they didn't, couldn't use gravity. So they found a new way to create their beautiful webs by going across the lines linearly. And I thought, you know what? We all need to become spiders in space. We all have to adapt to the situation. Yes, we're going to be like drunken spiders at the beginning. <laughs> and we've all been there. <laughs> but our beautiful webs are going to be, are going to be uh, put together eventually as we adapt. And the quicker we adapt, the more successful we're going to be. Um, I, I think the retailers that didn't have a website or online sales before uh, know now that they have to have it to survive. Yeah. Um, and I'm finding that, you know, some of those that were resistant are finding that the tech isn't that, although we've said, you know, it's hard and you've got to adapt. They're finding that it's not as hard as they had imagined yeah. initially. Yeah. And so they're doing pretty good on that. Um, it's less scary. Um, the retailers are going to have to communicate better with their consumers. Um, you know, more Facebook lives. I don't think those, I mean, some stores are having huge successes with um, their Facebook lives. They're doing better sales than they did this time last year. They're working 10 times harder, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're surviving, <laughs> they're finding ways to do that. And I think they're finding that with the new way of selling, there's a new um, way of purchasing products. 
that, you know, before, if you're selling one-on-one, -on -one, you can sell that one product that you have in the store. You only got one of that one. When you're selling online, you may have an audience of 20, 30 thousands. That one product isn't good enough anymore. Yeah. You're going to have to buy the 20s, the 30s of that one product, which they're not, the small guys are not used to doing that. Yeah. So changing your buying strategy according to the purchasing strategy of your customers. And that was a little bit resistant for some stores at first. Um, you know, they wanted to get rid of the stuff they had in the store, mm -hmm. but they're realizing now that it wasn't worth the time and effort to create an, an event or a, a class for four or five products that they had in the store. So they're, they're being a little more savvy and again, pivoting, becoming spiders in space. Yeah. And patience. I think it's patience on the side of the consumer and of the retailer. You know, it's, it's different right now. So you're not going to be able to, I guess, in some cases now you can walk in the store again. So, you yeah. know, we've kind of taken that next step. Uh, and then I know next week we kind of have a few more things that are opening up. So, um, you know, slowly we all adapt to that situation as well. So, and like you said, so many mm -hmm. of them, it's almost like they've had to start a whole new business, you know, whether they're doing yeah. the online sales or they're doing the the, the door pickups or they're doing, you know, the Facebook lives and doing promotions that way, or, you know, it's just almost a, a, a new business that they hopefully will continue to do, you know, after things go hundred percent back to normal, that they'll still continue doing those things. I think it's, it's inevitable. We're going to lose some stores. It's inevitable. However, on the other side, that means there's less competition for those that survive those that survive have learned to pivot. They've learned to, to change on a dime. They've learned new systems. They've learned ways to be more creative. So I think those that survive are going to be much stronger coming through this. Yeah, yeah. Oh, for sure, for sure. And how can manufacturers help independent retailers, consumers through this whole process? Well, I think for the manufacturers, there's, there's a couple of aspects. Those manufacturers that sell direct to consumer have seen huge sales. I know Spellbinders, we were just blown away with the sales that we had, which we had already planned a sale that just happened to, to coincide with COVID. And I know our warehouse was backed up and you know we were on short staff and there was no air conditioning in Arizona in the warehouse. So oh it was my. just nuts. <laughs> um, I think oh. also recognizing that the independent retailers need quantity of products at a good price because consumers are still price savvy. So if, if, retail, if the manufacturers can offer product quantities of products at a good price that they can, they can also share with the consumers, that's good. So manufacturers almost have to look inside the, the business and see what they can offer to the, manuf to the retailers um, to service their needs. They need to communicate with the retailers. What is it you need? And then again, we need to pivot as well as, as the retailers. And so, you know, as Spellbinders have had lots of advantages in doing that because we've already started communicating with the, with the retailers and what did they need. Um, I think I, one of the other advantages, we have two major advantages. We have a sister company called Fun Stampers Journey, which was a direct to consumer product. Um, and then in January, we've been opening that up to our retailers. And of course, the retailers didn't really know much about it at that point. Um, so, you know, we've been slowly bringing over these 1500 SKUs to the retailers. Wow. And then, um, so that was, that's a new product line that we knew what was sold well, so we could tell the retailers, you know, we know this product sells well, you know, it's got an established record with our direct to consumers. And the other big advantage we had was in January at the trade, sh the trade show in Phoenix, the creativations trade show, we actually sat down with bunches of retailers and said, how can we support you? And they gave us some great ideas. So in January, we sat down in the office and we had a big discussion. What can we do? And we put a whole program together of how we can serve the retailers. Wow. Well, of course, COVID hit. And we're like, oh, well, put that on the back burner. And then a couple of weeks into COVID, we're like, hang on a second. We could use that right now. <laughs> and of course, we'd already developed the program. We'd already put the bundles of ideas together. And so we tested it with a couple of stores and they went, holy cow, this is great. This is amazing. And so then we released it out to the rest of our retailers and we sold out completely of all these. It was bundles of product that they could, they, they just bought the whole bundle all coordinated and they took it into the store and they either showed it and 
and um, you know the, the consumers can buy the whole bundle or they make projects out of it and you know I constantly get more emails have you got some more have you got some more we've got some more coming for Christmas and then talking to the retailers we're like what about if we did a warehouse sale just for retailers where they buy in bulk so we looked at our inventory of our fun stampers journey and saw what we had excess inventory of not the junk stuff but what we had excess inventory and we created a warehouse sale we provided we uh, did a video so we showed them all the products and we showed them some projects they could make with it it was about a half an hour and we gave them a downloadable um, order form so they could watch the video and tick off the order form send the order form in and we have done really yeah pivoting how can you do things quickly effectively and as we've gone through we've learned a few things that we can do better and a few more suggestions of things that we can do so I think you know and we've also started off doing daily tips to the retailers at the beginning (laughs) when we got to day 50 I was like hang on a second we're not going to do this daily anymore let's do it once or twice a week it's getting a little Mm. uh, a little monotonous of in the same things and yeah, um, yeah. so we do we do um, um, emails out to our retailers a couple of times a week with some things that we found you know with my Canadian retailers sending out some information government information uh, for the US uh, retailers that I also service you know sh- sharing some of the great Canadian ideas you know <laughs> oh, awesome yeah, <laughs> yeah they, they've been loving that so I think the key is to use the social media use the virtual stuff um, use what you have to pivot. I know Spellbinders has a great um, library of videos, the classes, showing products. I mean, even just this week, they've released four or five new videos on products. So these are great for the retailers to use in their social media. They're great for the consumers to use, obviously on our direct-to-consumer line. Yeah. So uh, Spellbinders is in a great, great place right now. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Now, any advice that you can think of that you could give to the consumer right now to help support some of those smaller independent craft stores that maybe are just really hurting right now? Like, what can we do as consumers to to help them through this time to make sure that we have those small mom and pop stores or these studios? I, I think of so many of the different people that have very small stores and they give classes and, you know, they're at that point where, you know, they're not sure whether they can continue, you know, what can we as consumers do to support them as well? I think the first thing that they can do is to contact the the little store and say, look, I know you're having a hard time. They need encouragement because there's, I mean, I get emails and that some of those stores are just so downhearted. Yeah. Encouragement, I think is the first thing. And that doesn't cost much. Also, I think sharing on your own Facebook or social media links to those stores. So those you know, so encourage right traffic. Idea. You know, I bought I bought such and such a you know product from ABC store. It was great. Service was great. Recommendations. Go onto those stores, uh, Facebook pages, and give them recommendations. That doesn't cost anything. Obviously, you want to buy from those stores. Tell them what you like. Um, tell them where you've seen them. And I know it's 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 hard when you can get stuff from Amazon <laughs> and, and other places, but you're not getting those very quickly right now. Yeah, yeah. And you're not <laughs> you getting the support. To wait till... You're not getting support of the retailers. You yes. know, like I know, you know, when you buy it on Amazon, there's not a person there that's going to, you know, help you with any questions you have uh, with those products. So, you know, I feel the same way. You know, like there's certain products that I need. Uh, you know, you're better off to call the store, go to the store. And like you said, share information about that store, whether it be on Facebook or, you know, to your friends or to other companies or whatever that that, uh, you know, because there's so many wonderful independent stores out there. Like you said, some of them are not going to survive, but we really hope that, you know, a majority of them will, that they will get through this and, and get stronger and pivot the word, you know, the old word pivot. And, uh, you know, it's, and it's just a matter of, of taking a leap, of fa- a leap of faith and saying, you know yeah. what, I've got, I just got to do this. This is what I have to do to get to that next level. And hopefully it'll be better on the other side type thing. So mm-hmm. for sure, for sure, for sure. So um, I'm good. We're going to show, was there anything else you wanted to, I know we have a video to show yeah. um, from Spout. Maybe you want to just kind of give a little information about that video. 
Well, we've been doing a lot of videos on our, some of our recent um, products. So they're usually about five to 10 minutes. There's some great techniques and ideas on there. Uh, if you go to the Spellbinders blog, you'll see them all listed there. There was a new one came up this morning too, and from one of our new releases. So I would say just, you know, subscribe to the Spellbinder blog. You'll get lots of ideas. Even if you're not buying Spellbinders products, you're going to get some great ideas. Yeah. Um, as far as Canadian customers, you know, um, if you buy, it's hard to buy direct from, from Spellbinders because of shipping and, and duties and stuff like that. So if you're looking for a retailer in Canada, um, you, there's lots of uh, stores that you can, you can buy the Spellbinder products from. So um, give them a call and say, look, I've seen such and such a video, or even post that, vid share that video on the Facebook page of that retailer and yeah. say, look, this yeah. is what I would like to buy this by. Is anybody else want it? So that they can put an order in in that respect, because it's definitely much better for Canadian consumers to buy through the store than it is to try and buy direct from the Spellbinders. It's it's just it's ridiculous the pricing, yeah. uh, you know, with the exchange rate, the duties, the postage, and the delay. It's just not worth it. Yeah. So it's great. It's a great advantage for the independents. Awesome. <laughs> well, we'll show the video and then we'll come back and wrap it up. So we'll just uh, I'll get it uh, up here. Hi, Nicole from Spellliners here. I'm going to be creating a few projects using some beautiful dyes from Becca Feakin's Vintage Treasures and Candlewick Collections. So let's take a look at the dyes we're going to be working with today. We have our topper here, we have our Candlewick Circles, and we have our noble Chatelaine. Now, the, the really the hero of this one is going to be this guy. So I'm gonna focus here, but we will be using just a few dies from these other collections. So I'm gonna pull that one out, and then I'm going to focus on, really, for this one, just this little inner piece here. And the rest we're gonna use in another demo. So a couple of things that I want to point out about this die. This utilizes what we call split rim technology. Well, what does that mean? That means that it's incredibly versatile, first of all, because you can use the die to cut it out as one kind of solid piece, if you will, by connecting the two outer cut lines. Or you could just create an outline kind of topper here, which is what we're gonna do today, or you could just use this bottom one to create kind of a fancy fun edge to the bottom of your card. So again, the split rim technology, like we call it, really allows for optimal versatility with this one die. So as I mentioned, we are gonna take away this bottom piece and we're gonna create a topper for our card today. Now we're gonna create a little note card holder and this is going to be really at the centerpiece of that. So what I have here, I have a basic A2 size card and I'm actually gonna turn it around this way. And we're going to align this die to go along the top. And I'm gonna tape that in place and then I'm going to add in the other piece. Actually, I think what I'll do is I'm gonna run this through which is the outer cut line right now. So I'll run this through and I'll make sure you don't fold your card because if you fold your card, you're gonna have a shaped card and easily just peels right away. And now I'm gonna go back in and I'm gonna add the detail piece. Now again, you can do this all at once. You could do it with one pass, but sometimes things shift on me. And so I wanted to make sure. Now we wanna decorate the front as well. So I'm gonna bring in some of those dies I mentioned earlier. We're gonna go ahead and start with the Candlewick circle. So I've got a little piece of cardstock here and a tip with the candle wick. The candle wick basic shapes is to cut your outside cut length first and then to come back in and add your detail piece. Now I always like to run detail dies such as this towards closer to the edges of the machine. That's where the pressure is the greatest and that's going to give you really nice clean cuts. The other benefit of doing that is you do get kind of that embossed look by running it along the edges closest to where the pressure is greatest. So this is going to be a focal point to hold our sentiment. Now to add a little bit more detail and a little bit more of a focal point, I'm going to do another die cut using the insert piece that we had originally pulled out from the Noble Chatelaine die set. So now we have these two pieces which is perfect to host our sentiment. 
so we're going to be adding a note card into this. This is really going to become our sleeve for this little note card. And that's really cute and really showcases it, but I want to bring in a little extra punch. And for that, I'm going to grab some printed paper. Now you can go through your stash and find any printed paper for this. This beautiful floral, I think really works well with this die set. So we'll go ahead and tack that down. Now this note card is a little bit smaller than a standard A2. It's five and a quarter. this way by four high in this case. So it fits just perfectly into that little, little note card. So that's gonna slide in. Now obviously we need a way to close this because otherwise the note card's gonna pop out. And yeah, you could tack down these edges, but we don't have a lot of room to play with here. And I am a big fan of belly bands. I just think they're so much fun. So we're gonna do one of those for this. So I have a strip of cardstock here and we're gonna use this to secure this. Now remember, we cut out these pieces that are gonna act as our focal point on the front. So rather than wrap this around the back and have an edge on the back, we're gonna do a little trick here. We're gonna turn it over. I'm gonna go ahead and add a little bit of glue here. You can use you know, any kind of strong adhesive. And that's cute, but we wanna take it up one more notch. So we happen to have this beautiful green ribbon that we're also gonna to use to adorn this belly band. So just like with the cardstock, we're gonna add a little bit of glue here and we will wrap it right around. So let me make sure I'm even. And now we know where our focal point is going. Now, big, big fan of dimensions, so we're gonna go ahead and pop that up on the front. And we'll do the same here. Now we're just missing a sentiment. So we can add any sentiment here. For our example, we have opted to add a glimmered sentiment using our hot foil system. So let me bring in the finished project. So there you have it, this charming little note card holder. You can fill out your sentiment here and send that to your loved ones. Now, I mentioned that this die features, this die in particular has this split rim technology. And I wanna show you another example card that uses that in a slightly different way. So here you see that it really is very similar to this one where we only used the top of the die. So remember we had our detail piece, we have our outside upper cut line and our outside lower cut line. And for our project that we just completed, we used these top two. Now for this project, which is perfect for an invitation or anything, I, I didn't tack this down, but the idea here is that you would tack it down and you could put any number of messages on that, is that we use, we use this a couple of ways. Number one, these silver pieces, these silver adornments, are cut out with both the outside uh, upper and lower cut line or die, dies in place to create these kind of standalone die cut pieces. But then for this outside blue piece, we did just like what we did on the card we just completed. Took this one away, actually took this one away, and just used this to die cut that edge. Does that make sense? So again, these split rim dies are incredibly versatile and allow you to create a multitude of different types of looks. professional photo we have a professional studio in the warehouse in phoenix so our, our um, videos are very very high quality yes that's beautiful now somebody did ask and maybe we didn't really mention what is spellbinders well spellbinders is a predominantly a die cutting company we're actually the company that um is the original die uh, uh, thin metal dice uh company so um, everybody else kind of copied afterwards, but they were the, the innovators of the product. So they're just tiny little dies that, as you saw on the video, you run through a manual die cut machine or you can have an electric machine and they make some amazing cuts um, on paper. Um, some of the, the some of the other dies that we do, the steel rule dies will go through different products like uh, some thin wood, some leather and things like that too. So predominantly a die cutting company, but our um, sister company, Fun Stumper's Journey, 
has everything you can imagine in their product line. Wow. But one thing I did want to mention, I want to give a shout out to some of the Canadian stores that are selling the, Can the Spellbinder products, especially the bundles and some of the products that we have from our warehouse sale. So I apologize if I miss anybody, but um, Clipper Street in the Langley, BC, Point of Gift and Craft in Markham, Paper Crafters Workshop in Markham area, I forget exactly, uh, Scrap, Scrap Addicts in Edmonton, Scrapbook Essentials on Vancouver Island, Crafty Capers are also in Nanaimo on the island. Uh, Scrapbook Central B Central BC, which is also in Vancouver Island, and also Scrapbook Central, which is in Quebec. Staplicity, which is down, um, I think it's Port Hope. And then for any US um, customers, uh, listeners, we have lots of US stores that are purchasing Spellbinders, but the one main one that's been a great help with us in helping us tweak some of our products, uh, our pro uh, bundles has been Scrapbooks and More in Wisconsin. So uh, if you're looking for Spellbinder products, those are great places to go. I uh, highly recommend all of them. Um, Clipper Street as, as well in, in Langley, BC has been one of our um, stores that has been helping us tweak. And they do together at two every day and they ship across Canada and to the US. Wow. So two o'clock BC time, which is what five o'clock time here. She <laughs> has some amazing deals. And what's really good about some of these stores, including Clipper Street, is they're passing on the deals to the consumer that, you know, they know what the regular price is, but they know what they've paid for it and they're passing on the deals. So uh, tune in to Clipper Street at, at together at two. I know um, Paper Crafters Workshop is doing a similar thing and so is Scrap Addict in Edmonton. And um, I think Stamplicity is doing a few things online too. So definitely if you're interested in any of the bundles and taking a look at them, check out their websites and uh, see what they have. And if they don't have what, what you're looking for from Spellbinders, then uh, give them a call. You can go to spellbinderspaperarts.com to see the products. If you're in Canada, the prices are gonna come up in Canadian. Don't have a hissy fit <laughs> <laughs> because they're still shipping on top of that. Take the SKU number down, take the description and contact your local store and they'll bring it in and you'll get it at a much better price. Oh, perfect. Perfect. <laughs> well, <laughs> I wanted to thank uh, Nicole from Spellbinders that did the video. Now, what's her last name? Do you know? Um, Westerfeld. Okay, perfect. That was wonderful. And just wanted to make mention too that she was using one of Becca Fekin's designs in the uh, yes. the video there. And I know I've I've met uh, Becca, and she's just an amazing uh, lady. Now, where is she from again? Uh, she's from Florida. Oh, from Florida. Oh, yeah. awesome. So she finally got back into her house after the hurricane. It's been what two years? Oh, wow. The host house is completely demolished, but she is coming out with some amazing Christmas stuff oh, I'm just you know, I'm so excited <laughs> I've just done a lot of um, movable pro product um, pieces and she's definitely have has her own stuff so that stuff is going to be we're releasing it to the retailers this week uh, for pre-orders and it should be in their shelves by the end of July so Christmas mm. in July <laughs> we're we're on top of it. we all have so <laughs> Yeah, I know I met her at one of the uh, AFCI uh, retreats that we did, or CHA retreats, and just a warm, giving uh, lady, mm -hmm. just wonderful. Because I, I don't do a lot of scrap, but she made, it, she made it look easy, and she made it easy for us to do things. So I really appreciate yeah, her company's that. Called, um, her company's called Amazing Paper Grace. Okay. So if you perfect. Google that, you can see all her videos and all her products on there. Well, we'll make sure that we put that on our page as well, that if anybody wants information where all the different contacts where they can go to to get that as well. So, uh, and thank Perfect. you, Paula. This has been great. It's just so nice to have you on the show and sharing your wealth of information with everybody. I know a lot of people, I, I, I always hate that I can't mention everybody, but there's so many people, Shara, Linda, Anita, Nila, Vicki, Julie, Roxanne, Ruth, Karen, uh, Diane, like there's just so many that are on right now watching us and uh, quite a few of them have mentioned, you know, how interesting it was and such a great uh, information for them to to uh, end the project and things like that. So nice to see different types of art forms from all over across Canada. So we really appreciate you coming on and mm -hmm. have, to have you on again sometime. So. <laughs>
Uh, next week, sure, sure. I, mentioned, I don't know if you know Becky, Becky Sharstein McGettigan. McGettigan, I hope yes. I said that right. Yes, that's she, one store I forgot. She That's uh, Crafters Haven XY, I think. She's another, that's one of the ones I missed. <laughs> yes, she is going to be on the show next week with her son, Sean. They've been doing uh, crafting videos, her and her son. I believe he's six years old. And so they do crafting with Sean. So she's coming on and uh, she's going to be giving us a tour of her store. She opened, I believe, a week or two ago. So she's kind of, I think it was about a week ago because she's in, uh, where is she? Saskatoon, right? Yes. Yes, that's right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, so they've been doing some crafting, her and her uh, son, and doing some videos. So they're going to come on and do a video tour or a studio tour and doing a, a kid's crafting project. So that'll be really uh, neat to watch as well, right from her um, her shop there, Creative Haven. Um, and then, yeah, just a reminder to everybody that tomorrow is our, our big day, our Pin It Canada live virtual event. It will be on Facebook, just as you're watching today, uh, from noon till 5 Eastern. So it's going to be a, a long afternoon of crafting, uh, but we have some fabulous, fabulous uh, um, presenters and some great demonstrations and project and a great variety. And they're all very, very excited about it. We had, like I said, our run through last night and uh, everybody's just pumped and can't wait for tomorrow. And uh, we have Wendy Russell, who was best known uh, for her show, She's Crafty. I know you know Wendy as well. And uh, she'll be our, mm -hmm. our keynote speaker to, to start the day off. And uh, so, yeah, we're looking forward to that and, and so much more. So all, uh, virtual is where it's at. You know, that's where we can connect, communicate <laughs> and be together. And if you can't see the whole show tomorrow that you can't, you know, you don't, you know, certain segments you want to watch, we will have that show, our Pinna Canada a Live Virtual One, plus all of our Audrey live shows on our YouTube channel as well. And we'll put the link that it's basically if you key in YouTube Pinna Canada, we are there. So um, thank you, Paula. And thank you everybody for watching and being with us today and uh, have a great week and have a great weekend. So bye-bye. Yeah. Take care.